Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. Um, chips have arrived for the 32X. Um, I ended up um, getting some original chips. Um, long story short, the chips I was intended to put on here, um, I did have a go at fitting one of those. I've not shown that. Um, it's, it's not really much to show, really. It would be a waste of time, I guess. Um, but they don't, but just rest assured, they don't work. Um, and I think that's because of the rast cas uh, timing differences. Um, uh, something that uh, I didn't really spend a lot, a great deal of time thinking about what I should have done, reflection. Um, nevertheless, it's, um, yeah, I managed to get hold of some of these. And these are poles, so I don't know if you can see, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty good. There's a pin there that's a little bit bent. You can perhaps see it on camera there. I just need to straighten a little bit. Um, so I may have to try one or more of these. I'm not really sure. The state of them, it doesn't say whether they were tested, whether they were taken from a working board. I guess they've been taken off a, a sim uh, or a dim or something. But we'll just get some of this uh, chip quick flux on there first. Don't need masses really, just enough to cover. Let's just use something flat um, and obviously a magnifying glass or something just to be able to get, uh, you know see what's going on there, just to strain uh, that particular pin. So I'll do that now and then I'll show you the result. Right, there we go, they are pretty flat now. Might not be able to tell, but yeah, just used a, you know, like I say, something sharp just to, uh, you know, just bend, just the odd one slightly out of position and then something flat, like the edge of a ruler, or in my case I just used a, a flat blade screwdriver just to just go over the very bottom uh, part of each one of those, just make sure they're totally, totally flat because these have been reclaimed off another of board. So I'll just set the camera up here and uh, I hope we'll be able to see this. So I've got to make sure you get pin one lined up the correct way. Just set that on there and we will just try and line this up. Now it's going to be awkward because I've got this uh, board, the upper board there, sort of in the way, uh, restricting me a little bit. And this is on a slant, so really you want to do this sort of thing on a flat, totally, totally flat surface so the chip's not sliding around anywhere. Um, so it's better with a magnifying glass as well, make sure you've got pins totally aligned. That's pretty good actually, you just need a bit lifting up a little bit, I think on one corner. This corner here, a little bit more. And then what I'm going to do is just tack one corner of the chip here before I just inspect it, make sure it's totally aligned and stuff and uh, before I commit to doing any major soldering on there. Don't worry about having too much solder at this stage. It's really just a case of tacking it, you know, making sure you've got it positioned properly. That's looking pretty good. Right, that's looking pretty good now, so we'll just do another corner here. Well, again, don't worry about having too much solder. That's it. And then we got some more flux on there. Should do. Right, <clears throat> right. we can now start the process of just doing some drag solder in there. Um, you just need to just heat and drag all the way along. Now, I've got too much flux there at this stage, so it's going to, going to need to remove some of that with um, the solder, the solder braid. I'm going to worry too much about that for the moment. I'll do that in a sec, the cleanup work. Let's just do the top, top side. Let's get a bit of solder on there, because moment there's no real solder on that top side. Restricted a little bit there by that SMD cap in that corner so what I'm trying to do is just turn this round so I can get a better angle so you can see what I'm doing. It's 
So as you can see, we've got up this, as soon as you get towards this top side here, that's got a little bit too much solder there. We'll remove that in a minute with some uh, desolder braid. Let's just go over this side again. Okay, got quite a lot of extra solder there, so not a big problem. I'll just use the desolder braid here just to suck up some of this. Need to nip that. I've got way too much actually on the bottom side there. I'm going to use a little bit too much shank of the two corners, but it really isn't uh, a big problem. So I need to add a bit more flux there just to what with this. So now, should you be able to hopefully do a final sort of pass over this. Still got a bit, much, bit much there, you can see it, a bit, a bit too much in that corner. But it's looking, it's pretty good now. Hopefully final pass on the top. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. So, just got a little bit extra there to deal with. Yeah, that's not so bad. Just needs a little bit of a clean, but as you can see, it's uh, it's on there nice and straight. Um, it's looking okay. So I'm just going to give this a quick test and see what happens. Right, there's some weird stuff going on here. I'm getting the same problem, but worse. Um, now there's a chance that the chip is not right, but I don't think you noticed, and it just just caught my eye there, and I had a, a zoom in because I thought, you know, is that right? If you look at C14, you're probably not going to be able to see this. But the cap's missing. It's completely missing. Has that been missing all along? Is that what the fault is? Um, it seems strange that heating this area up um, and freezing it made it such a difference as it did. But anyway, I'm going to try and replace that. I've had a look at the schematics and it's 470 peak farad. And it's something to do with the uh, VCC PLL. Um, I'll show you on the schematics afterwards. I'm just going to. I've not got a 470 peak farad cap. What I've got. Is a couple of 200 peak farads. I'll stick them together. Get that'll give us 400 uh, peak farad, and uh, see how we get on with that. Well, you're not going to believe this, but I do believe that capacitor was the problem. Um, I'm absolute. I've just got absolutely gobsmacked. I'm completely gobsmacked. I really am. Um, I need to look back at previous videos here to see was that cap there? Was that cap ever on the board? Was it a case if it wasn't making a good connection? Um, you know, this would have crashed by now. This would normally would not have worked. I'm getting some problems when I first sometimes reset, you know, the reset button's not working. Sometimes I switch the thing off and on. It can be difficult to get it to come back on. And I know what that is. That's the, that, the variable cap that someone's been messing with in the past. I need to, um, you know, get a frequency counter or something onto that. I'm not sure I'm going to go about doing that yet. Um, might have to wait till I get a new scope. But, um, I mean, this is... This is working now with just a hundred peak farad cap there. It's supposed to be four hundred and seventy peak farad. Um, so I might find that that issue with the reset and stuff actually is resolved once I got a proper four hundred and seventy peak farad cap. Um, but let's see if we're working. Well, as you can see, it's working and it's flawless. It's been on for half an hour now. No glitches, no crashes, no nothing. And I've tested all the games that previously wouldn't work, and uh, yeah, they're not crashing. So it's very interesting because this, you know, was an unexpected twist um, in the events. Really, the SD RAM, I'm guessing, is fine. I'm guessing the original SD RAM is fine. I'm going to keep that. Um, the useful spares, anyway, because at some point these will fail. Um, I mean, it depends on the usage and stuff, I guess. You know, if they're not being hammered all the time. These things it could last a hell of a long time before they fail. But it's just interesting that heating up that SRAM chip and freezing it gave the uh, behaviour 
of uh, you know making it either not power up or the graphical corruptions go away. Um, I'm curious as to when that cap disappeared off that board. I've got to. I'm gonna have to look back very closely at my old vi the previous videos I've done on this to see if I, I don't know if I've got any close-ups of that area to determine whether that cap was ever on the board, whether it was just hanging on and it wasn't, you know, making a good connection, or whether it's always been missing. Um, but there's still one issue with this, and the, the, you know, the sense if I press the reset, I'll show you if I press the reset button and I'll press it now. Nothing. It just has no effect. So, I'm not sure if that's normal. Um, or not and it doesn't seem normal to me I would have thought you could reset it maybe that's what you get with the 32X I don't know I need to test with my other 32X to determine if that's normal behaviour um, but I'm going to order um, an SMD 470 picofarad cap for this I need to work out what size um, I'll just show you in the schematics where, where that cap is right so I've got the schematics up here and um, I deliberately found the page with the um, the two processors you can see you've got the um, IC the SH2 master SH2 slave um, I'm just going to zoom in on this just to try and uh, make this a little bit easy to see what's going on uh, right here we go yeah so you've got the first uh, processor second processor and I think somewhere down on the second processor if I remember um, you can see there so that looks like pin ooh, 108 is it 118 can't even see it but we're looking sort of um, here where you've got CAP1 it says which goes out through a, a, a resistor is that 3k can't really tell from here um, C14 470 peak farad so that cap was missing and the interesting thing is if you look here VCC PLL VSS PLL so you've got some phase locked uh, loop stuff going on um, and that cap is part of that component um, there so I'm guessing this is to do with free, some sort of frequency control circuitry here um, quite a while that cap would I can't imagine it would blow itself off the board it looks like it's just come off so I'm guessing that maybe it was loose at some point I don't know um, and quite why heating the um, that SDRAM you know had the effect it did I'm not really sure, unless it is to do with the, that, that phase lock loop, maybe it's to do with the timing of the uh, SDRAM clock frequency. Um, and maybe heating the pro the, the, that chip up, there's obviously, you know, there's going to be some tolerance stuff going on there when it changes temperature. Um, and the temperature change is enough to make sufficient difference to that clock, or the clock, you know, the input to the clock there, that whatever's going on with that cap missing cap is not enough to, to cause a problem if that makes sense so when it's cold it can actually exist without that cap but when it's warm it starts to warm up to normal temperature or beyond um, the lack of that synchronized uh, clock there um, you know the phase lock loop possibly means that you get the crack you know the glitching the crashing etc very strange um, I'm kicking myself thinking how, how did I not notice that cap was not there, I'm convinced it, it probably was there and I'm convinced as I've done the work on it over the last few videos, particularly the last video, um, I'm convinced that that cap's come off of its own accord at some point, it's just fallen off and I've not noticed it. I've had a good look round, you know, I can't see it anywhere, it's not inside the console, it's not, you know, I, I don't know, a bit of a mystery, complete mystery really. Um, Anyway, I'll just uh, run through a few other things I want to talk about actually with uh, regards to SDRAM. Um, but I need to, I'm also going to do a test quickly now, briefly on the other 32X, just to see what, what's going on with the reset thing. Is that a, a known sort of uh, behaviour or what? Just something else I want to show you quickly here. If you just look at the um, two SH processors side by side, I suddenly started thinking, well, okay, the pinouts must be the same, it must be, have its own PLL type uh, clock control sort of circuitry there. And indeed, it does. Uh, you know, you can see C11 is the 470 picofarad one there, whereas you've got C14. Um, I'll be just for point C14 is the one obviously that was missing on the first SH2 processor. You got C11. So, you know, some of the, some of the symptoms there were leading us the right path in terms of you know one of the processes. We knew the master one well. I suspected the master one was okay at the time. I thought it was the secondary one, but you know, in reflection, actually, the, the first one actually was probably okay. It was the second one that was um, glitching because of its clock, um, or the you know the lack of this uh, PLL type circuitry. And if I just um, page up, 
So just looking at the um, diagram here, the uh, block diagram overview, um, you'll see here you've got this PLL um, component there. Um, and you'll see that you've got 46 megahertz on one side, 23 megahertz on the other. So this is for the, the SDRAM. So the SDRAM's going to run at 46 megahertz and the um, processors both run at 23. Sorry, apologies for correction there from previous videos where I thought it was 21. It's actually 23 megahertz. A bit of an unusual frequency, but nevertheless, that's what it is. Um, and you can see a bit of a description there. Phase lock, loop, PLL, Porsche provides two clocks, one to 23 megahertz is always running. Two to 46 is split which then becomes CPU clock. CPU clock runs only when the software selectable Mars bit is set in IC4 system register. So that looks like the, I don't know how, but the CPU, from under, my understanding and reading the way that reads, is, says it's always running 2 to 46, is split when it becomes CPU clock. CPU clock runs, not really sure what that means, to be fair. Um, I'm guessing it, it means that at various points in time it can, you know, you will get a 46 megahertz clock out there. Whether that goes to the processor, whether that goes to the RAM, not really, not really clear on that. But um, there's certainly, you know, some synchronisation going on there between different clocks. Um, and the other thing is, you know, interesting point with this is if you follow this V clock, obviously the source um, is the Genesis. Um, I guess it could be a destination. It's not really clear. It just shows it's connected to it. So um, that could be why I'm not getting the reset problem. I've just tested actually on the other working 32X and the reset works perfectly. So there could be, this, there could be some issue here with um, this still, but that's probably because I've only got um, 100 peak power caps and 470 on that PLL circuit. So I need to, need to order a cap for that. Um, and then the final thing, once hopefully that will resolve my problem with the, the reset. Um, it, this could be related to the reset actually. Um, I mentioned that variable cap there that can be adjusted and you need a frequency counter, so I'm going to have to try and sort that out. Might have to borrow one off someone, I'm not sure how I'm going to do that yet. But it's a case of, um, and it describes here, it says, you know, sort of um, connect 5 volt DC to IC12 pin 31, um, which puts it in test mode, and then connect your frequency counter to IC12 pin 20, and then adjust the cap until basically you've got that frequency there 3.579545 uh, plus or minus 10%. Um, so I'm going to need to do that anyway, I'll need, like I say, I'll need to get either a new scope or a frequency uh, counter before I uh, have a go at that. Um, one other thing worth mentioning as well, there are a couple of other things actually I just want to mention while I'm here, um, and that's the, um, you know, one of the things I thought when I was looking at this is there's no um, ROM, you know, there's no onboard ROM on these, there's no ROM chip. Um, and I did wonder why that was, and the f my first thought was there must be something embedded somewhere, maybe these processors have got firmware, and that's exactly what it is. After a bit of research, um, I discovered that these SH2, these Atari SH2 processors, both have an uh, embedded uh, ROM, because um, you need something there, you know, when the f we switch the machine on, you need something to bootstrap from, they don't, you know, the, these systems don't typically boot from the actual ROM itself, uh, you know, the, ROM, the cartridges, I mean, you know, they don't boot from the carts, there's, uh, you know, uh, various OS type, um, car on the uh, you know ROM on there that's that the CPU will bootstrap from from a particular address um, and that typically contains you know copy protection software region protection and all that sort of stuff um, so that's that's the, the case with this is that the both um, both those processors have got embedded um, ROMs on them um, which can cause it could cause problems in future I guess if those ROM images become corrupt um, you know you, you're a bit knackered really um, not really sure how you would reprogram one of these um, if it, you know, if the ROM became corrupted, you may have to use and some of the take the chip off, put it on a board, some sort of programming type solution or something that um, will allow you to reprogram that. You know, provided the CPU is probably still working and whatever interface it uses to be able to program that ROM is working. Um, I guess it could be done. I don't know. You'd have to research a, a, a little bit more on that to understand how to reprogram the, the embedded uh, firmware on these uh, SH2s. But the other interesting point about that is it means that you know if you ever had a scenario where one of these processors failed you can't just you know take one of these from a donor board you know um, without thinking about which processor it is you, you know you'd have to replace um, the IC1 you know the master processor with a master processor because of that master firmware they're both different and it'd be the same with the slave you know so you know you, you know it's just worth mentioning that really um, I don't think that's ever going to happen you know people probably just swap the whole board out or something well, so as a final thing, I'm just going to tidy up this chip a little bit. I did remove the flux and stuff with the slicer pop, um, but there's just not quite enough solder on there, in my opinion. It doesn't. It looks a bit uneven. So I'm just going to put a bit more flux on there. Um, 
and just add a little bit of salt, just give up, go over that just one more time. Um, really just to do a bit of a more, slightly more professional job there, just because I'm not happy with the way that's looking at the moment. I mean, it is working, but like I say, I'm just not happy I've uh, got enough solder. Now I've got too much bloody solder. Okay. I guess the key, really, with these is tr not trying to heat the actual pins, but the actual pads. Um, if you heat the pads, you get a better distribution of solder there where it needs to be rather than just being sort of um, up the, uh, the way on the chip. Inspect the magnifying glass. Yeah, that's pretty good, but one thing I do want to just tidy up is we've got a couple of wires there, got a bit of solder flooded into them, which isn't a problem, but it just looks a bit of a mess. I just want to just soak up to the very edge of that there. Have a quick look at the magnifier again. Yeah, that's not bad. Just mop up that uh, bit of solder off that test pad. It should just be a bare sort of exposed copper pad. That I don't know how that's got solder on there. It could be me even when I've removed the original chip and stuff, but. Um, that ain't bad, so yeah, what you do is you just use a cotton bud, lint free is the best. And just uh, give it a bit of a wipe around there. It's curious how that cap has uh, come off the board, I'm perplexed to say the least really. Has that been there or has it been missing all along? Was it partially hanging on at some point and fell off? Um, I honestly don't know. Did have a quick look at one or two of the videos. I couldn't tell whether that cap was ever there or not. Um, but thinking about this, you know, the behaviour of this, what was what we were experiencing, um, was interesting in its own right. In the fact that um, you know this temperature thing with this uh, the S drum, you know, you heat it up, won't boot at all. You cool it down and it's fine. And I think there's a, a logic, you know, there's obviously always, you know, logic says there's always a reason for these things. So when you start thinking about how that was behaving, um, and you look at what the actual cause was, you know, this PLL phase lock loop not working correctly, it stands to reason that what was probably happening is it was at the, the S tram, the, the RAM bus here, was being overclocked just slightly, potentially perhaps when it was changing. You know, it mentions in the, the, the schematics, the, 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 you know, the schematics there, the data sheet for this, that um, at various points in time it cuts over, it's, you know, it, it seems to split the clock or something. I, I don't really fully understand how that works and what goes on there, but just, you know, just from reading that information there, I started to make uh, you know, alarm bells ring with me. I started to think, ah, okay, well, if the clocks, the clocks aren't synchronised and there are points where clock, the clocks change over, depending on um, you know, difference in functionality, um, then it stands to reason that due to that lack of synchronization when you're changing from one clock speed let's say 23 up to 46 or vice versa if they aren't perfectly synchronized you're going to get uh, glitches there in the edges you know leading trailing edges that could mean that it's overclocked for short periods of time um, now whilst it's not cut, you know it's not enough there to cause it to lock up completely presumably because the, the periods where it's running at those different clock speeds are short, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's not sort of 
not continuous, it's not continuously running at that overclock speed, you just get a really quick uh, brief glitch there where it's swapped um, switch clocks from, you know, down from 46 to 23 or up, up from 23 to 46 and at that point where you get that transition and you don't get a clean, um, you know, synchronised cut over to the different clock speed then, you know, you could be overclocking, I don't know, let's say instead of 46 it's running at 52 or even 80 something just for one split, you know, one second, one cycle um, which is enough to not crash it, but, um, or for the most part, but to um, cause some graphical glitches. And obviously as the thing warms up because of that overclocking, um, you know, over a short period of time as we've experienced here, um, you eventually get um, a lock up or a crash, which is, you know, that's understandable because these things can't run that fast. These particular chips are only designed to go at the 46 uh, megahertz, or slightly there above. Um, you know, for this particular board. So you can see that it's pretty cleaned up. Um, I'm going to do the same on that row of pins there underneath that uh, that chip because um, I did redo that at one point and again it's not got a very even distribution of solder so um, I really should have done this before I started cleaning up but it should be pretty easy to do that. May as well just do that now while I'm, while I'm here. Um, but there's going to be a part 5 to this video. I've ordered a uh, 470 uh, pig forward cap um, so that should come in the next three or four days, hopefully. Um, might be a bit longer, not sure, sure where it's coming from. Um, but as soon as that arrives, I'll um, replace that cap I've got on there at the moment, which is temporary. Um, there's still not enough solder on there in my mind. It, it looks, it's looking like, uh, there we go. Yeah, I was trying to get the solder on the bottom here rather than actually up, up the pins. Um, some chips you don't need to worry so much with this. It's, it's pretty easy to reflow these without having to specifically you know keep going over like I'm doing here. You can just literally drag it across. Um, let's have a tiny bit of flux and I'll just give it one more one more go. Let's see if we can distribute that uh, excess solder a little bit better. It's not so bad. Let's have a quick look with the magnifier. Yeah, that's pretty good. Probably got a tiny, 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 tiny too much just on that last pin there. It's annoying because that passive cap is just in the way. Let's take a look again. That's not so bad. It's not perfect. I'll do a macro in a minute on these. Um, again, just clean this up with a bit of uh, isoprop. As I say, I should have really soldered that side before I started to um, redo. Um, yeah, I should have. Uh, sorry, I should have shouldn't have cleaned up really until I finished the whole lot around there really, because we just have to double up on the amount of cleaning uh, I'm doing around that area. But uh, yeah, that's not so bad. Just dry that up. So just as a final thing, I just like to get a bit of kitchen roll onto the tops of these chips because doesn't, the flux doesn't always come off very well when you're on the top of a, a chip like that. It's, uh, it's easier to get it off the board than it is off the tops, tops of those. Obviously, you've got to be really careful. You don't want to snag anything. Okay, not looking too bad there now. It's pretty clean. Um, just wait for that cap now. I'll do the next video as soon as that arrives. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.